Hello. This is my animal lover video for the spring. Spring 2019. We're in May. Lots of clouds out there today. Uh, and I've decided I want to talk about gorillas. I want to talk about things I've learned about gorillas, things I just looked up on Wikipedia about gorillas, and things from the gorillas that I have met, and the gorillas that I have painted. Just quick, this one, this is Ajari. Ajari is from the Houston Zoo, and I've actually painted Ajari three times. He's a member of the Bachelor Troop of Three. Um, I painted him more than the others just because he gave me so many good reference photos. Um, although my favorite of that group was sort of emotionally a, a gorilla named Michael. Uh, and this is Nzinga, uh, and I, I, I just saw Nzinga for 20 minutes or something like that when I was at the Santa Barbara Zoo. But uh, Nzinga just gave me this wonderful, wonderful picture, and he had recently arrived on that zoo, uh, which gives him views of the Pacific Ocean, I must say. Um, and this is Matt, and Matt is from the uh, Sedgwick County Zoo in Wichita, and uh, I got a big crush on Matt too, and he was a brand new papa, uh, a 10-day-old baby, when I met him the first time. Second gorilla story goes back more than 20 years because my niece, who's now in her early, you know, early 20s, uh, was a baby in a baby carriage at the time, and it was at the National Zoo in Washington, and it was in, it was in the winter, it was cold, and uh, there was nobody there except for me and my brother and my niece in the baby stroller. And we go to the gorilla house, which did at that time have a sign outside that said, if you, hey, if you want to really you know, interact with a gorilla, then um, don't stare at them directly. Look at them and look away, look, look away. And if you really want to get into it, then turn around and back up to the cage. Um, and then do that looking, looking away kind of thing. So I did that, and you know, and Brian did that. We came in, and there was this big glass wall with a silver back there. Uh, behind it, and then off to the side, there was a, another in another section, and Brian pushed the stroller over there, and and I turned around and backed up to this cage, um, and the silverback was he was on his haunches, and he was on the far opposite side of where I scrunched down against the glass. I remember I was wearing my cowboy boots. I was glad of the heels because my knees don't actually bend all that easily. And I scrunched down, was leaning up against the glass and looked at him and looked away and looked at him and looked away. Now, I don't know, but it wasn't a minute. And he was up and he was over and he was spooning me. I mean, it was this 600 pound gorilla. I'm likely not exaggerating. Uh, who was, I mean, I could hardly see him then because he's right behind me, but I would, you know, try to look a little and look away. But he, and then Brian came around with the stroller and he sat facing outwards and he was looking and looking away. I really didn't get much of a chance to see him, but I was getting his vibe. It was quite, it was quite, it was quite intense. Um, and because of him and because of other things, I have now learned how to flirt with a gorilla and get them to come and, uh, um, and come over and visit with you. So uh, I did it most recently at the uh, zoo in Denver. Again, I just happened to be there on a you know miserable, not a very good day, rainy, something drizzly, cold. So I had it to myself, and I'm I'm in the indoor part of the uh, gorilla uh, section, and there's a there's a silverback there again in a. Um, He's in a, some kind of a plastic culvert, this big, it's about this kind of diameter, and it is about a section that's maybe about this long, and it's, well, I have pictures you'll see, and it's hanging, and he is in there, his head out one end and his, one of his legs out the other end. And the people who were in this little room, the kids, they left, and so I said, well, hey, my turn. So I went over and I sat down against the glass of his enclosure. You know, just this way, but looked looked over and then looked at him and looked over and looked at him. It didn't take him 30 seconds, and it actually scared me because it was so abrupt. But he was out of that thing, and he was sitting right there. Like, here's me, here's the glass, and there he is. He really came over to hang out with me. What I, was, what I asked him to do is exactly what he did. And, uh, you know, then we just sort of hung together. What could I do? I took a couple of pictures, though I felt really... I felt like I was cheating him to take his picture and that kind of thing, just because he'd been so personable, but gorillas. So when I went to the Houston Zoo uh, for the first time, the, the, it was about two days from their new gorilla habitat opening. They had, hadn't had gorillas in the zoo. 
almost all gorillas, well, maybe all gorillas, that you will see in a zoo in the United States is going to be a western lowland gorilla. They had both a family troop, uh, which in the family troop is always one male, one mature male, and then the females and the f children that are his offspring or that he thinks are his offspring. Um, and that is the group, and that's the group in the wild, and that's the group in zoos too. And then the bachelors, the older mature males, they tend to be in their own troop, and they generally um, get along. So the bachelor troop at the Houston Zoo was three gorillas, Ajari was one and Michael was the other, and and oh, I can't remember. But, oh my God, just watching them, uh, and they were waiting for some kind of treat, something, changing of the guards, so there was a little jockeying going on with them. They did this once in a while, and then sometimes they would run, and it would be like, oh my God. It was, it was just so zero to 60. It was just so <sighs> virile. So when I first, you know, hung with these gorillas in the Houston Zoo, which was besides that first time in D.C. where the gorilla spooned me, um, it was my first time actually spending hour, two hours watching these animals. And I, you know, forevermore just think they are about the sexiest creature. <laughs> it's not a human on the planet. They're quite amazing. So. There was apparently a guy named Hanno the Navigator about 500 years BC and he's the first one that used the word gorilla in that and he was on the, in the Sierra Le what is now Sierra Leone action, uh, section of the that big bulge of, of the northern part of Africa there and he this beings which may or may not have been gorillas that he saw he gave the name gorillas and he he said it was mainly females and they were very hairy but he actually took them to be a kind of people but anyway no one really knows if what he saw was gorillas but nonetheless that is where we get the word from the name was derived from an ancient Greek word and it means the tribe of hairy women. Uh, there's two species and then there's subspecies. So there's eastern gorillas and there's western gorillas. And um, the western gorillas are the western lowland gorillas, which are the ones that you will see in zoos most commonly. And then also something called the Cross River Gorilla that I know nothing about. And then the Eastern Gorillas are the Eastern Lowland Gorilla that you will not find in a zoo and also called Grower's Gorilla I believe and perhaps the most endangered of the gorillas even though they have slightly more in numbers than the mountain gorillas who are also a uh, Eastern Gorilla subspecies. And you will not find, there's no mountain gorilla in a zoo anywhere in the world because they don't survive in zoos anywhere in the world. Mountain gorillas, I believe, a little bit of good news here, are the only gorilla species that has been increasing in number versus decreasing. And uh, perhaps the reason for this is that the local community has now embraced them as uh, something to be proud of and something that from which they earn income because that people want to go and see these animals. And so, and they are earning, there's a lot of jobs within that. The rangers are heroic and lose their lives, several, several of them every year. Uh, and the local community understands the, how good this is. So that the mountain gorillas are the ones that are actually increasing in numbers, even though they're the fewest, the, the growers, the eastern lowland, are decreasing their bush meat and gorillas can get Ebola just like you and I and they live in Ebola Central. So the Congo River and its tributaries are what divide these two species. It's a very small part of the planet on which gorillas live. They do not have a lot of territory. So in the, the western lowland gorillas are over there on you know the way Africa comes around in that that little elbow there. Uh, it's in there and those jungles in there. And gorillas are vegetarian, mainly. Uh, 
they will, uh, you know, they eat berries and they eat leaves and they eat all sorts of, they eat that kind of thing. They don't really drink water in the wild because um, they get enough water from the foods that they consume. Uh, Western lowland gorillas especially have a, mainly a fruit diet. Um, although when you go to zoos, what I really see the, um, them eating is greens. So they're eating kale. I mean, they're just eating big greens. Uh, and they're liking it. Foraging for food and, and resting and guarding their territory is really what, that's, what gorillas do. So speaking of that, I said Matthew was the uh, daddy of a 10-day-old baby when I met him. And my sense from him and from every other uh, the gorilla that I've seen who's with a family troop, um, he was doing his role. He was protective. So he was, he was relaxed. And, and he was just lying on his back there, but keeping an eye on things. So he sort of always knew where his brand new baby was. And uh, the mama likely always knew where he was. And he would every once in a while pop up and go slam himself against the glass. And then he would just sit back down. They were just letting everybody on the other side know who was the boss and just everybody else knowing who's the boss. Okay, so let's talk about silverbacks because I hear all sorts of people use silverback incorrectly. Um, silverback is not a species. Silverbacks are what happens to a male gorilla. They start you know, around 12 years old is when they begin to get it and they literally get these silverbacks and it comes all the way up over to the top of their head and it comes all the way down here and it gets more and more silver as they get older and older. Uh, apparently also their canines grow uh, and become, I mean, they, they're lethal, they become lethally long, but their canines is part of this whole aging thing. Um, but it is an age-related thing. And I think there's an, even a term for blackbacks, which is a male gorilla before uh, he starts doing the silvering thing. Just a male gorilla of a certain age and of a certain age. So in the wild, these guys could live 30 or 40 years. Um, in zoos, 50. In the wild, the, um, so you've got this family troop and the, uh, you know, the babies are born and the daughters and the daughters grow up. Well, the daughters then are, aren't really going to stay in the troop where, the, uh, where their father is the, you know, so the main source of sperm. So they, are, they go on their ways and they eventually find to create a new group, which is how some of the bachelors in the wild then also create new family groups. It's not just about waiting for the one you know, guy to die. Now, speaking of that, when I was in Houston the second time, the, uh, the male gorilla, the silverback, who was the, the head of their family group, he, he was quite elderly. And they had a young female that was going into heat. So the zoo, what would happen is that this older male, he was now, his, his genes were now well represented in the gene pool. Uh, that's something tracked by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums for these endangered species. So that there's a genetically diverse population out there. So they, I don't know for how many years, but for several years, they did not need any more of his, of his genes within the gene pool. Uh, and so he was actually put on um, you know, birth control, basically. Um, he didn't know about it and he was fine. So, and then when one of his females in his group came into heat, the zoo, unbeknownst to the male, actually she got to hang with one of the other males in the, from the bachelor troop. And became, I don't know who, who won the lottery on that one, but she, when she became pregnant, she came back in. Now the male, the, the head of the family troop, has also been having sex with her. He did not know he was shooting blanks. Perfect, because when the child is born, he is assuming the child is his, and 
and so he is protecting it like they would because that is a problem. I mean, infants are very vulnerable, very, very vulnerable. So if uh, an infant is, is born and still within the first year of its life and the, the head of their family troop dies for some reason, that infant's rate of survival is terrible because the next male coming in won't want that infant around. He's, he, it will be killed. Oh, here is a, here's a really weird gorilla experience that I had at the Denver Zoo. And uh, I had visited them multiple times and this was a day that I had maybe, you know, most of the day to spend at the zoo. And I walk around and around and around. So there's a door space. This was a good weather day. And um, so there was just one gorilla right in front of it. He, he's in this enclosure here. And, and I'm coming back around and there's been a group of, you know, 20, 30 people who have, you know, gathered in front of him watching him be a gorilla and, you know, a couple people deep and I am approaching from this side and as I come up en masse, this group turns around and goes, oh! And as they pass me, I hear comments like, oh my God, I can never unsee that. And uh, I'm like, what the heck is going on? So I, you know, I got up to the to the fence where I was the only one now because everybody had turned away. But there was actually some, still some people who were stragglers that I, you know, could sort of glean what had happened. So this gorilla, uh, his enclosure is. Um, there are bunny rabbits that live in his enclosure. They can sort of come and go. There are ways that they can come and go underneath the fence and they're sort of throughout the zoo. And, but this gorilla, just sitting there being a gorilla, this vegetarian gorilla, reached up and picked up a bunny rabbit and bit off his head and started chewing. And that's everybody going, ooh. I never saw that, thank goodness. It was an indistinguishable something in his hand by the time I came up and he, he continued to eat it until he was done. So they're not always vegetarian. Now let me see what else I wanted to say about gorillas from the, my Wikipedia pages that I was reading. Oh, one thing, they have fingerprints, just like we do. And their vocalizations, they have about like 25 different kinds of vocalizations and grunts and moans and things that they can use. Um, to communicate various things with one another vocally. Okay, oh, here's this cool thing, and I, this one I wanted to read anyway. This is the ritualized behavior, gorilla-only behavior, and this is what they do. These are the ways to do it. So, it, the ritualized charge display is unique to gorillas. The entire sequence has nine steps. One, progressively quickening hooting. Can't make the sound. Two, symbolic feeding. Three, rising bipedally. Four, throwing vegetation. Five, chest beating with cupped hands, just like in the movies. Six, one leg kick. Seven, sideways running, two-legged to four-legged. I've seen them, seen them do that. Eight, slapping and tearing vegetation, and nine, thumping the ground with palms to end the display. So that's their anger management. <laughs> that doesn't end in a fight. That stops a fight. Intended to intimidate without becoming physical. Now, I told you about how little part on the planet in which gorillas live, and hopefully I've shown you maps. And, you, okay, so when did we first, besides this guy in 500, uh, Hanno the whatever, in 500 BC, uh, when did we first see a gorilla? They saw skeletons before they saw a, uh, a gorilla. And the first one, by a Westerner, of course Africans saw them, but Westerners, during the Civil War, in the 1856 to 1859, I mean, right there, Civil War time, right there, right there, Civil War time. First Westerner to see a live gorilla through his travels through Western equatorial, equatorial, equatorial Africa. 
from 1856 to 1859. So we had never seen one. But then look what a creature the gorilla is in our imagination. Look at King Kong. Look at this, look at this mammoth beast. So it had this hairy females. You see their power. And when you were around them, I, I was so aware of how powerful these guys are when I was with them. Given how much time they spend relaxing, I don't know how they're that strong, but they are nothing but muscle. You still, we see one of them from, from behind on their back. It's an astonishing thing. I mean, it's like, why this big thing? So these guys epitomize power. And so that was the mythology around them for a really, really, really long time until well into the 20th century, in the, even in the 1960s when Diane Fossey was going in to see them. And finally we began to understand that no, they actually could also be gentle. Out in the wild, they have their territory. They've got to go get their food. They travel with their group. Uh, uh, the uh, family group more cohesively perhaps than the male, the bachelor groups, but they sort of keep track of one another in their dense habitat. Uh, but they don't go very far. They go like a third of a mile a day. Western lowland gorillas go maybe six-tenths of a mile a day in their f foraging. I thought that was pretty interesting. This is my favorite part of a male gorilla. These pecs that they have. Hey, an amazing creature. <laughs>